last speaker is Dr. Uh, Ravindra Vattu, who will be talking on defining our role in the management of uh, IH. After his stints in medical centers of repute, he uh, started his own practice at the Bhattu Eye Center at Bangalore. And a fellow from Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital at Melbourne, he continued with his interest in neuroophthalmology and in particular, intracranial hypertension. On to you, Dr. Ravindra Bhattu. I think you should do your screen sharing. He was there all along? Yes, it was there. Yeah, he, he's, he's just sharing. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, good evening and good morning uh, to all of you. And thank you very much for inviting me for this talk. What is our role in the management of uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension? I just oft asked question here was who should manage IIH? In the early days of uh, raised intracranial pressure, when uh, ICP elevation was poorly defined, it was mainly the neurologist who, working with the neurosurgeon and the radiologist, was able to diagnose something called pseudotoma cerebri and completely manage them. Whereas the ophthalmologist was relegated to the backwaters, just documenting progressive visual loss in these patients without much of an input in terms of management. Evolution of knowledge to the disease, evolution of terminology, pseudotumor cerebri gave rise to the word benign intracranial hypertension because neurologists did not believe that loss of vision was benign. And then this led to the uh, slightly better word, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, uh, divided into its three now accepted modalities. And then a loose word called secondary IIH, where you don't have a tumor, but you do have certain associations or certain drug toxicities, which cause it. And I believe a little more accurate statement on the latter would have been intracranial hypertension due to the appropriate association or drug toxicity to mention the exact cause in the secondary IH patients. Advances in imaging from x-rays to contrast x-rays to CT scans and finally to the MRI and the MRV have led to increasing knowledge about the characteristics of this disorder. Non-interventional radiology has given place to interventional radiology allowing us to not only monitor the intracranial pressure, but also to intervene in certain cases of IIH. Drug therapy, drug therapy has evolved, starting from the most commonly prescribed and even today my favorite drug, Diamox, to other diuretics. And finally, we are looking at other investigational drugs that are being tried in limited cases. Uh, which show promise of the exciting results. Some of the greatest fields, uh, changes that has happened in, is in the field of ophthalmology, where we have better methods of contrast vision acuity checking, ultrasound evaluations of the optic nerve in the retrobulbar optic nerve imaging and uh, measurements, ocular imaging, dish photography, infrared photography, ocular coherence tomography, which is playing an increasingly important role in the management of several disorders, one of them being papilledema and IIH, and the switchover from the old-fashioned kinetic perimetry to static perimetry, reproducible, and probably the single most important change that has happened in ophthalmology so far. So what is the change? The change is this. We are now taking a center stage in the management of IIH, helped along by the neurologist, the neurosurgeon, the interventional neuro neuroradiologist, basic scientist, researcher, endocrinologist, nutritionist, bariatric surgeon, and maybe the geneticist. Looking at the terminology, I'm going to be specifically restricting myself to IIH, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which follows a very typical phenotype. And you're seeing that most of our patients here are obese women in their reproductive years, uh, excuse me, reproductive years. 
and they follow a typical pattern of visual loss and lifestyle. One of the problems that neurologists do have when they try to evaluate uh, IIH when they're acting alone without the help of an ophthalmologist is a presentation. Relief of any of these symptoms does not normally necess necessarily imply that CSF pressure has been normalized because every patient may develop any of these symptoms at any level of intracranial pressure. This is where a neurologist is usually handicapped. So IIH diagnosis is usually made on the basis of seeing a typical patient, an obese woman in her reproductive years with a recent history of weight gain and probably has PCOD. She has the symptoms attributable to raised ICP. Neuroimaging will reveal a flattened cella, a vertically tortuous optic nerve with increased subarachnoid fluid, probably an empty cella of varying degrees, and a follow-up MRV may or may not reveal varying degrees and focalities of transverse sinus, uh, the venous sinus stenosis. An ophthalmic examination done in these people will show papillinema of various grades or even up to a pallor, a frank or subtle six nerve weakness. The disc in some cases may be actually be flat. The patients with IIH without papillinema, and it's very, very important to look for venous pulsations, either spontaneous or introduced, yeah, inducible on these discs to suggest a raised pressure lurking behind in a symptomatic patient. Look for ocular causes of disc swelling. Patients have been treated for bilateral optic neuritis and turned out to be bilateral uh, uh, VKH. Last but not the least, please check the blood pressure because patients referred to me for IIH have sent to the ICU with pressures of, blood pressures of 260 by 170 after just having a quick look at the nature of the swelling. Ophthalmic beads and ultrasonography is one of the simplest things to do. I use a lot of it in my practice. It has not been described much in the literature except recently to try and look at the optic nerve head size in an axial section. But what I do is a modification of what is described in the textbook by Sandra Byrne and Ronald Green. And I do a B scan over a transnasal section and you can see a crescent of clear fluid uh, uh, CSF around the optic nerve head done easily in three minutes. <laughs> done easily in three minutes flat. And you can see the crescent beautifully. This is a qualitative test. It shows you that the CSF is contributing to some or all of the patient's edema or symptoms. Just photography, is this serial dysphotography mandatory? Yes. Is stereoscopic dysphotography mandatory? Probably not. Preferably the same machine with the same magnification. Will printouts do? Definitely not. One has to see the digital pictures. One this minute will tell us, yeah, this will tell us whether our current intervention is effective and at what rate it is effective. Follow-up serial photography will show a disc which is characteristically now, the floods are receding and you can see the disc becoming dry. This is the right of the same patient who was treated with high doses of Diamox and who referred to me for an optic nerve sheath penetration. He is now completely cured about eight months on. OCT in papillarima has now become of age. More and more abnormalities are being detected in the papillidomatous phase and in the post papillidomatous phase. And its potential for research in this field is enormous. There are some of the important uh, things I had to pick up because I personally do not have an OCT, nor, nor do I have, nor do I use OCT routinely in my practice, which I probably should be doing. And uh, this is going to be a major investigational tools in the year to come. Perimetry, so probably the single most important criteria to determine the starting dose and subsequently the taper and then the maintenance dose of Dimox. Which machine? Doesn't matter. I prefer a 32 dash program, although the, all, most of the trials are 24 dash two. The key statistical parameter is the deviation of the mean. The MD will tell you whether you're on the right track in managing the patient. This is a patient who, whose disc you have seen earlier showing a gradual improvement of the mean deviation. Right eye, left eye, and then right eye. So what determines the initial dose? Is it the photographic severity of the papilledema? Is it the height of the CSF on manometry? 
or is it the severity of visual loss is it necessary that all these three correlate not necessarily my personal decision to base the initial starting dose is entirely based on the amount of visual loss on perimetry <laughs> i will i will just skip this a beautiful article was shown how an optic nerve the amount of disc edema does not necessarily correlate with the csf pressure uh, this was a study done showing the histopathology of the optic nerve sheath follow up duration of these patients is going to be weeks or months the follow up duration is going to be for many many years because this is not a disease like diabetes or hypertension which lasts permanently it is a self limiting disease which has remissions and exacerbations and for this patient reason these patients should be followed up very very carefully for years the nature of the follow up how soon you need to follow up depends upon what stage of the disease this patient has and these are some of the uh uh i i will skip this uh, which is weight reduction is a very very important method of uh, decreasing the necessity for diamox or density for other interventional programs when do i surgically intervene i in surgical intervention is indicated in the event of progressive visual field loss and uncontrolled pressures despite maximally tolerated medical therapy a, a principle i follow is resembling a glaucoma paradigm these are some of the surgical options my current options are one conservative second a prefer a tp shunt to a optic nerve fenestration or a tp shunt with an optic nerve fenestration follow up is lifelong but the rate of follow up depends upon what stage what is the degree of papilledema and what stage is the visual field loss thank you very much thank you very much dr batu uh, dr rohit do you have any questions to ask so uh dr batu is uh, of course now he says that he doesn't do that much surgery but he's one of those who pioneered uh, optic nerve sheath penetration in india actually and uh, i personally looked at his videos uh, initial videos and now i mean like of course we do it very frequently but that's it so dr batu when would be your indication to plan an onsf see if i have a patient who has got uh, fulminant high ih rapid loss of vision and the vision loss is to an extent where the cannot be easily recorded on a snellen chart massive papilledema and the patient is at risk of uh, and and other significant neurological symptoms then i would like to go in with the neurosurgeon while he does a tp shunt or a vp shunt i will do an optic nerve fenestration oh. right to a patient who comes to me at end stage disease where he has got vision of finger counting close to face and who has previously already had a tp shunt done and if i detect fluid on the optic nerve on an ultrasound that is enough excuse for me to realize that there could be some function there could still be significantly raised pressure do i do a repeat lp i would prefer to refer this to a neurologist i am not primary a neuro ophthalmologist i i i will, I will refer the patient to a good neurologist and ask him his opinion and if he wants to do an lp and record high pressure then i will go ahead and do a optic nerve fenestration on this patient the indications for my doing fenestration have in the recent years become largely more emergency and semi emergency rather than as a primary resort i have a paper on early intervention in early damage due to papilledema and i believe that years have taught me that i was wrong <laughs> Uh, good, good, good to hear that. Although uh, people, uh, I'm sure Jyoti here also, a lot of us have become a little more, uh, uh, I, I would say, aggressive while doing opting. In fact, our neurologists are probably more aggressive than us. We keep referring patients for ONSF even when we feel that they have not given uh, adequate or complete uh, uh, medical therapy. They they somehow believe more in homeopathic doses of uh, astrazolamide, but. But that's it. Any any comments, Sachin uh, and right. Dr. Prem? If on, I have, uh, um, if I have anything, get, all the topics we've discovered. If I get uh, 50 discussed. references for ONSD, I I I actually decompress one. Sure. I manage the other 49 with just medical therapy, weight programs, and and good counseling. Uh, one of our studies here from our center has shown a significant impact of. Uh, weight reduction or swati had led a thesis uh, which had shown a significant reduction 
uh, of weight does help in the long term control and early reduction of uh, acetazolamide so uh, 2 2.5 has shown to be very effective yes very difficult to do properly as difficult as the optic nerve sheath penetration but uh, <laughs> but that's to actually uh, people uh, don't advocate it What? Sorry, Dr. Sharma. Sir. I said a lot of times we have to re-emphasize re that weight reduction is mandatory, and that is overlooked. A lot of people don't realize, and yes. sometimes it's only the last, like in lockdown, couple of people would have pulled up weight only in that time. So many times that is missed. So it may not be that the patient is overweight, but they have picked up a lot of weight in that last couple of months, which is also good enough to reduce. In fact, when the question, the question uh, which was raised by the other people was that. do you envisage that the weight loss would be achieved in two months time that you are planning to do a study and it right. did work so it is <laughs> dr sharma is practically impossible say about was uh, the sdoct uh, following up with upper smith's work and that's a, again a very good uh, investigative tool in peptidema cases uh, the following the rp brooks membrane angle with this clara and we have found that just not uh, differentiating the cases of papillitis uh, and early papilledema it also helps in prognosticating the cases of papilledema we see over a period of time this change in the uh, positive angle of rp brooks membrane with the sclera so this is something which is non invasive which can be done uh, and we have found it useful dr prem dr sachin any comments on anything uh, anything we've been discussing thus far Dr. Abhika has a question uh, yes. to Dr. Bhattu. Yes. Uh, Dr. Bhattu, have you ever advised any of your patients a venous sinus stenting? I have had two patients who have undergone a venous sinus stenting, but that was purely a, a, a decision made by the neurosurgeon and the neurologist uh, and the aggressive neuroradiologist over there. Uh, but she is doing very well. She was a lawyer who was on eight tablets of Dymox for eight months. and uh, i think the dimox was getting to her because she was about to dissolve her marriage so i said it's time to intervene <laughs> one question In i have for dr uh, sachin uh, so uh, what is your take on uh, ih in a patient with normal bmi it is it happens let's start with that but it is extremely uncommon and rare it's what we call as atypical cases and i think a few years ago uh my colleagues and i wrote this paper from emory where if you see such cases then you have to investigate them to the hilt for a secondary cause so always look for mimickers like cns inflammation uh venous sinus thrombosis uh um, you know uh, maybe even a spinal block uh so anything else before you blame it on uh on ih so i you know of the five six patients that i've seen in my practice i can i can tell you that almost all of them had something else so one of them had a low flow dural av fistula as a cause of papilledema and as soon as that fistula was blocked the papilledema went away another patient had a a uh, spinal block at i think mid thoracic level and once that was fixed the papilledema went away so always exercise caution in those patients i i completely agree because uh, most of my atypical uh patients are have been either on excessive doses of retinoic acid creams for acne or they have been mothers have been feeding them a lot of vitamin a gummies or they've had uh, uh severe bleeding because of menorrhagia and once the hysterectomy was done their ih the so called ih disappeared overnight women who were given uh, progesterone uh, estrogen combination pills for mm. uh, menstrual regularized menstrual irregularities uh uh they they come with uh, papilledema i have had uh, quite a few uh, anti psychotic medication related uh, ihs but it is all presumptuous uh presumptuous rather than a definitive thing uh, based on a couple of case reports reported in the literature but these patients had them and i agree with you 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 do not have the typical phenotype you need to investigate you need to take a detailed history you need to the particular disc edema which i which i showed you was a young thin md psychiatry student from uh, nimans 
he was sent to me so that i could convince him to undergo a tp shunt by the director of nimans so when he came to me and showed me his papilledema like that i said uh, why don't we manage you conservatively and i did it took about 4 months for him to settle and then we found out why he was having it see he comes from north india the plains of uttar pradesh he's come to bangalore at 3000 feet above sea level and he had developed a secondary polycythemia to an extent where he had to be bled he's gone back to delhi he's gone back to rohtak actually with absolutely no dimox required anymore so that gave us breathing time so one thing to remember is the disc edema is because of axoplasmic stasis so it's intraneuronal edema rather than extra neuronal and you can think of any number of causes for optic disc swelling with mechanical being just one of them so if you follow that kind of an approach you will immediately see you have to exclude other causes before you blame it on just uh you know uh, iih so blood pressure being one of them that's basically vasomotor instability you can have toxic metabolic causes sometimes they present acutely but that kind of florid disc edema is rare you see mostly a mild kind of an edema in toxic metabolic dr sachin how frequently you have made a diagnosis of unilateral iih with papilledema um i would say i can count it on my fingertips and you know those are unusual cases again you may have significant discrepancy in disc sizes on the two sides you might have atrophy on one side a burnt out edema on one side and edema of the so called pseudo foster kennedy syndrome um but again it is it is uncommon and almost always i attributed to some difference between the right and the left eye uh, i had a patient with unilateral fenestration who developed edema in the other eye uh you know so i i can i can probably explain why they had unilateral but it 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 does occur uh are we we are done with the questions i have a last question to dr bhatto how do you manage uh, ih patients with uh, uh in pregnancy a pregnant patient comes and a bilateral disc edema and it's a real challenge they well if i if i if i if i see a Uh, if they, it all depends many times you see a patient before they get married or before they get pregnant even though they are married so i tell them don't get pregnant for some time right if you really plan to have a baby you need to stop diamox at least 2 to 3 weeks before you think of conceiving forget about you know missing your first period okay and that's very very important because it's very teratogenic because particularly so if they're on steroid now during the pregnancy i would i strongly re- recommend that they have they watch out for symptoms uh, of all the important symptoms of headache try to keep a weight gain uh, chart try not to put on too much weight but of course you know sometimes it's not possible and come ask them to come for regular checkups for me to uh, you know monitor their uh, papilledema now believe it or not there are two patients of mine who decided to have babies got pregnant the papilledema disappeared until after they weaned the baby and the papilledema came back after they weaned the baby and that's very interesting that's very interesting but i always warn them that you may na- you may need a uh, draining lp two or three times during your pregnancy if there is a threat to your vision but this advice has to be given so you mean to say that you stop dimox if they get yes. pregnant see there are controversial points in the first trimester it's a strict no no some people believe that after the first half of pregnancy it may be safe to give dimox but why do you want to take a chance i don't like to give dimox in pregnancy maybe the other panelist could comment dr prem dr sachin I do use Divox when necessary in pregnancy. I think your options are sometimes limited. Um years ago I did some work uh, with Kathleen Degree and her husband who is a perinatologist and uh at high risk obese and his take on it was you do what's necessary to protect the mother's vision. So he was actually in favor of using Dimox in appropriate situations. He felt that the risk of it was lower 
then the risk of vision loss in patients with significant papilledema, and he was actually an advocate for it. Yeah, so I think Manos, if I remember correctly, has a position statement saying Dimox is actually safe with no reported cases of teratogenicity. How I approach patients in, in pregnancy is it, it all depends on their baseline vision. If their baseline vision is not good, then I will start them or keep them on Dimox. And it depends on visual fields and OCT assessments. If they are already on Dimox, if they are back to normal, I will take them off of it. But if, if, if it's a vision threatening, then I treat them as I would treat a non-pregnant patient. Now you would avoid unnecessary uh, imaging studies, especially CT scans. But again, you can always do an MRI uh, and you would do it without contrast to rule out, you know, space occupying lesions or venous sinus thrombosis. But uh, I, I still use Dimox when needed. I think one thing which is a big no is topiramate, I suppose. If they become pregnant, stop topiramate. But uh, I mean, still there are groups which believe that you can continue Dimox in a pregnant patient. Provided, keep a follow-up with the OBG and your ophthalmologist. You see, the problem here is... Ophthalmologist in the U.S. probably continues Dimox during pregnancy, especially after Manos mm -hmm. put out a statement. I'm not aware of anybody who would stop it, but topiramate, we know, has a problem with Epstein uh, anomaly, and so we, we don't. Even in epilepsy patient, we choose not to keep them on it unless they have intractable epilepsy.